In the second movie, I'm going to talk you through the set of slides that you will then teach to your student and then develop a quiz that you'll give them to assess how well you think you've taught them signal detection theory and how well they've learned it. So to get started here, I'm going to be working with the SDT cell slides PowerPoint and the signal detection assignment document here. So let me switch to the signal detection theory training assignment. This talks you through how to go about teaching your student the material and how you're going to develop the quiz and then ultimately how you'll go through your report uh, and describe what your student learned and what they, uh, how well they did on your quiz and then how, what the correct answers were. The goal of this is to really get you to think about the underlying principles of signal detection theory to make sure you understand it because without an understanding of how signal detection theory works the next part of the class is going to be very difficult to understand. Alright, so take a look at that. But I'm going to talk you through the slides here. So these are some slides that Ji Sun, who is a former graduate student at IU, and Rob Goldstone. I don't know why it says Goldstone. There we go. Have produced. So imagine that you're a doctor who needs to make some tough decisions. Your job is to diagnose leukemia, a cancer of the bone marrow, by looking at blood samples. Since bone marrow produces blood cells, you can look for distorted blood cells to diagnose your patients. However, you're in a tricky situation because people with leukemia don't always have distorted cells, and people who are healthy don't always have pure cells. There are other factors that can cause or prevent cell distortion. But cell distortion is the only evidence that you have, so you must base your diagnosis on these blood cells. If you diagnose patients as healthy, they can go home. If you say they are sick, they must get treatment. You learn that cells can range from pure to distorted. As cells become more distorted, they increase in size, become more bumpy and purple. So this is a distorted cell here. This is a pure cell here. So this is the range of cell distortion that you can use to make your diagnosis. And this is the only evidence that you have from the patient, but you have to diagnose them as healthy or sick. As a doctor, it is important for you to note that leukemia is not the same as having distorted cells. Leukemia is sick bone marrow. Sick bone marrow is one of the causes of cell distortion, so it is evidence to help you in your task diagnosing leukemia. You must make your diagnosis based on cell distortion, but you cannot be sure who is sick and who is healthy, at least at the time of the diagnosis. As leukemia gets worse, you will find out who is actually sick, and this is outlined in red here, and actually healthy, outlined in green. So here we have the cell distortion in the middle, and here is the actual eventual outcome of the patient. Sometimes the cell distortion evidence that you have does not help you distinguish between actually sick people and actually healthy people. So you're looking for people who are actually sick, but they could have the same distortion as actually healthy people. The outlines indicate the actual status of the patient, whether they're actually sick or healthy, but the center gives you the whether the just the amount of cell distortion that you can observe. In your experience, you have seen some healthy people with extremely pure blood cells, but most of the healthy people you've seen have slightly distorted blood cells, and you've actually seen a few healthy people with fairly distorted blood cells. You know that most healthy people have low cell distortion. You've even seen a few sick people with extremely health distorted blood cells. That's usually the case with uh, sick people. But most of the sick people you have seen have only fairly distorted blood cells, and you have even seen a few sick people with only slightly distorted blood cells. So this is the most common. Occasionally you get this, and here you have people who are, um, have even though they're sick, have extremely uh, normal-looking or even only slightly distorted blood cells. You realize that most sick people tend to have high cell distortion. You know that cell distortion is not a perfect indicator of leukemia, but you must make a diagnosis. You must find a way to make accurate diagnoses based on this evidence. In order to do this, you can form a decision boundary that minimizes wrong diagnoses. So for example, this is a decision boundary where you diagnose these people as healthy on the left side and the people on the right side as sick. When you diagnose someone as healthy, they are shown with H's like this. When you diagnose someone as sick, they are shown with red S's like this. You can diagnose healthy or sick people, and that's the center of the square here, and the patient can actually be healthy or sick. 
So there are four possible outcomes. When you diagnose sick people, when you diagnose sick and the patient is actually sick, like this, you're correct. When you, you're also correct when you diagnose healthy people as actually healthy. This is this cell right here. So th this is when you're right. People is, are actually sick, as given by the outside boundary here, and they're diagnosed as sick, given by your label in the middle. And then here they're actually healthy, and you diagnose them as healthy. But you can also be wrong in two ways. So these are the incorrect ones. The person could actually be sick, but you diagnose them as healthy. That's his first case. Or the second case, when you diagnose them as sick, and they actually are healthy, as given by the exterior. So this is where you're wrong. The person is actually sick, but you diagnose healthy. The person is actually healthy, and you diagnose sick. So you see these, pa these patients here within one month time. So this is the period over which we're collecting data. Some of them are healthy, and some of them are sick. You must decide whom to send home and who to send for treatment. You diagnose these people on the left-hand side as healthy, and these people as sick, given this particular decision criterion. But later on, you find out who was actually sick and who was actually healthy. So the actually healthy people are in green here. The actually sick people are shown in red. And we can separate out these two distributions here so you can see uh, what their distribution looks like. So we have a decision criteria that's shown right here. And we separate the people who are actually sick, who you called sick, the people who are uh, actually sick, but you mistakenly call them healthy. We can look at the people who are actually healthy, but you call them sick. And we have the people here who are actually healthy, and you call them healthy. So let's think about, before we go on, the consequences of these different decisions. So here you've made a correct diagnosis. Here you have people who are actually healthy, but you made them go through an unnecessary treatment for leukemia, which is very painful. Here, you have a person who was sick, but you labeled them healthy, so now they're going to die. And then these are the people who are healthy, and you didn't treat them, so that's good. These are the people that appropriately received treatment. So maybe you could learn more or gain more experience to gain, get better at diagnosing the patients. However, if you change your information or experience, if that doesn't change, your decision process can change how accurate you are. So consider a situation where untreated leukemia is fatal, so you really want to avoid deciding healthy when the person is actually sick. So here what we're going to do is to shift the decision boundary to diagnose blood samples that look uh, like this as sick. So here you've diagnosed this person as healthy, but now we change the decision criteria so we make sure that this person gets treatment. So now where this person is going to live, and we have a new decision boundary that shifts from here to here. So after this shift, you no longer uh, diagnose people, uh, sick people as healthy, so these people are all getting the treatment that they need here. But you now diagnose more healthy people as sick. So now these three people are receiving unnecessary treatment for leukemia that they don't actually have. So that's the trade-off of shifting your decision criterion. But there are other reasons for moving your decision boundary. Consider another situation where the treatment for leukemia is a risky radiation treatment. Then you want to avoid sending healthy people to get treatment. So if you want to avoid healthy people getting labels as sick, if you want to avoid those mistakes, you can just shift your decision boundary to diagnose blood samples that look like this as healthy. So I could shift it all the way over here so nobody gets unnecessary treatment. Well, you can imagine what happens if you do this. If I shift it all the way from here, all the way over to here, we're not erroneously treating people who are actually healthy, but now there are one, two, three, four, five, six people who are going to be uh, untreated and therefore die. So changing the decision boundary is something that you can do to change the kinds of mistakes you make. There are also some things that are out of your control that also affect how good your diagnosis is. So consider a situation where it becomes even harder for you to diagnose your patients because everyone started taking these fad vitamins. This makes distorted cancer cells look better. So now sick people have less distorted cells than they used to. So now 
we, these are the people that you see, and there are no more of these extremely distorted cases because they're being masked by these fad uh, vitamins. So let's say your original decision boundary, this is the one you had before the uh, vitamin craze, and you're going to diagnose these people as healthy and these people as sick. Uh, later on you find out who was actually in sick and who was actually healthy, and we can pull this up, and now you can see that there's more overlap between the red and the green distributions. We're making, instead of uh, one error that we made previously with the same decision criteria, we're leaving three people who are undiagnosed. So now we have these three errors that are actually sick, but we label them healthy. Um, we have the same number of people who are uh, healthy, and we label them sick. So our situation has gotten worse because these two distributions now overlap each other much more. So here was before the vitamins. Uh, now we have after the vitamins here, and you can see how the decision criterion doesn't change, but the underlying distribution after the vitamins causes the healthy people, the sick people, to appear healthier, and that makes separating the two groups much more difficult. Uh, it's much more difficult to decide who to treat and to avoid errors. So before we had a total wrong of six items. Um, after the vitamins, but before the vitamins we actually had only four that were wrong. Because the vitamins changed the evidence, your accuracy changed, though you used the same decision boundary. So this is the end of the tutorial. Now I'll take a short quiz based on what you've learned. So here's the part of the, uh, when you're actually teaching your student, you should ask them whether they have any questions about the trade-offs that can occur for different decision criteria, and what happens if the distributions overlap uh, more or overlap less, and generally probe their understanding about the, um, how signal detection theory works and what the underlying distribution represents for a particular situation. You might even want to give them an example that's different than the ones we've talked about uh, to help them understand how you might apply signal detection theory in these different circumstances. So, once you've taught your student and given the quiz, uh, write a short report that describes the how you gave the quiz, what the answers were for your subject, your student, and then uh, briefly talk about what you think the student learned and uh, how effective you think your instruction of signal detection theory was. Now it's not critical that your student is somehow does amazing in this quiz. It's more important to come out of this assignment with an understanding about um, what the basic principles are between in signal detection theory, what the trade-offs are for different decision criteria, how more overlap or less overlap for the underlying distributions can change your overall accuracy. That was the latter part of the last uh, PowerPoint. It's more important that you understand that because you'll need that for the rest of this unit. So write that up in a short uh, report, and we'll submit it to OnCourse by the Thursday after spring break, and that will help you understand how signal detection theory works, and we'll incorporate that, which will be worth about three points, into your final paper for this uh, unit.